Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Swallowfield Chapel. We're glad you could be here with us this morning. My name is Jody Ann Brown. Our speaker today is Brother David Pearson, and the title for his message is A Time for Reflection. Please remember, share the th this link with family, friends, everybody that you know, and we look forward to what God has in store for us today. Let us pray. Father, this morning we come to celebrate your righteous rule, which stirs us to look to you in confident trust. You are the Lord who reigns forever, and your throne is established for judgment. But you judge in righteousness, O Lord, and you rule with justice and mercy. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, Father. Mercy and love and truth go before you. You, Lord, are a refuge for all who are oppressed. You are their stronghold in times of trouble. Our trust is in you, O Lord, because you will never forsake those who seek you. Draw near to us as we wait on you to hear what you will say to us today. We pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Morning, 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 everybody. Good to have you. Let us give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness and his justice. And let us sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. Who is like the Lord?
some verses from the Psalms. Who is like the Lord our God, who has his seat on high, who swoops down to look on the heavens and the earth, who works justice for the poor and the oppressed? Who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly hosts can be likened to him? In the council of the Holy One, God is greatly feared. He's more awesome than all who surround him. O oh Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here and online to give you praise and worship. Lord, we bring to you those that are sick, O oh Lord. Lord, we know you are a God that heals. So we ask you to place your healing hand over them, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray for full restoration. Does cast out any illness from their body, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray for their caregivers. We, know, we pray that they will have the sufficient energy and the proper judgment to give the appropriate care, O oh Lord. Lord, we bring to you those that are grieving for the loss of loved ones. Lord, we know that this is especially a difficult time. It is always difficult, Lord, but we know with the pandemic, there are restrictions in terms of the numbers in gathering, O oh Lord. Lord, we just pray for wisdom and guidance and understanding from family, family and friends in this time, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray for comfort for those that are grieving, O oh Lord. Lord, for those that are sick and grieving, O oh Lord. We pray that they use this as an opportunity to draw nearer to you or nearer to you, Lord. Lord, for those that don't even know you, we pray that they take this as an opportunity to get to know you and they grow in a relationship with you, O oh Lord. We know that in life we have many seasons, but we know that you are present and with us throughout all those seasons, O oh Lord. Lord, this week the Prime Minister declared 
stay to the election date, O oh Lord. During the pandemic, it has its own challenges, O oh Lord. So we commit the whole election process to you, O oh Lord, from end to end, from campaigning to voting, from everything, O oh Lord. We pray for good judgment. We pray for good leadership. We pray that people are responsible yeah. and we manage ourselves appropriately, O oh Lord. The world is facing a difficult time, O oh Lord, but and it has caused a lot of uncertainty. But we know that all is for good who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose, O oh Lord. So we commit this time to you. And in this uncertainty, we pray that we won't lose focus, that we commit our eyes and ourselves to you, O oh Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning again, everyone. The scripture reading for today is taken from Amos chapter 5, verses 1 to 27. Hear this word, Israel, the lament I take up concerning you. Fallen is virgin Israel, never to rise again, deserted in her own land, with no one to lift her up. This is what the sovereign Lord says to Israel. Your city that marches out a thousand strong will only have a hundred left. Your town that marches out a hundred strong will only have 10 left. This is what the Lord says to Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live or he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour them, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. There are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns midnight into dawn and darkness day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. With a blinding flash, he destroys a stronghold and brings a fortified city to ruin. There are those who hate the one who opposes justice in courts and detest the one that tells the truth. You levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, you have built stone mansions. You will not live in them. Though you have planted bush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil and love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, this is what the Lord God Almighty says. There will be wailing in all the streets and cries of anguish at every public square. The farmers will be someone to weep and the mourners to wail. There will be wailing in all the vineyards, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never fading stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? 
you have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord God, whose name is God Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Swallow. It's so good to be with you today. Today, it's almost a year to the date that, a year to the day that Alex and I went to Tobago. Well, I've been there before, but Alex came with me last year that he could finish up his schooling, his CSEC exams and so on, do his CSEC after a year when he was very ill. The good news is that Alex is doing well and he and I are back home, and it's great to be here at Swallow Field. It's so good to share with you this morning, and as you, as you heard, my message this morning is a time for reflection, and it's from Amos 5 that Jody just read for us. I'm going to ask you just to permit me to give you a little bit of a story as to how I got to this message this morning. You see, about three Fridays ago, three Fridays ago to be exact, on July 31, Alex and I sat on a Caribbean Airlines flight on the tarmac in Trinidad at Piarca International Airport, and I was hopping mad. Now I'll tell you why. Because Cal, that is Caribbean Airlines and the Trinidad and Tobago government, just gave us a little over 48 hours notice that we should be on a re repatriation flight if we want to leave Trinidad before September 31, September 30. It just gave us enough time to call home and speak with Cynthia and some other persons about this urgent decision that we had to make as to whether or not we'd come home on that repatriation flight. You see, Alex would have two exams outstanding if the date that I was told was true because he would have to reach home, we'd have to come home on July 31, the same day that Alex had his chemistry exam, and then on the Monday after, he would have physics. What made it so unpleasant for us was that in the limited time that we had, we were told by the CXC office that it was not possible for Alex to do his exams in Jamaica. The notice was just too short, and he had COVID-19 protocols to follow. Anyway, to cut a long story short, by the time we got to the plane on July 31, we were armed with the knowledge that if we could get Alex in to Jamaica in time for the exam, then he possibly would be able to do it. And the flight was scheduled to land at five minutes to nine Jamaican time, Alex would have a little leeway to get to the overseas exams office by 9.50. Well, there we are sitting on the tarmac, only to be told at the very last minute that the flight would be delayed. And it was delayed for one hour and 40 minutes. There went all the opportunities we had for Alex to do his exam, and I was not pleased. And I sat down on that plane and I was very angry. I know Alex's mother and Alex's aunt had been turning the world upside down to get him to do the exam. And it suddenly came to my mind that if we did get to Jamaica late, as was going to happen now, then we knew, I knew that Alex's mom and his aunt would do their best to still get him to the exam and make a case for him. So I sat down, and as I sat down and I calmed myself, I started to think about the great things that God did for us in the year that we were in Tobago. And I thought about the doors that he opened again and again. And then I said, how hypocritical of you, David Pearson, to be basking in all of this greatness that God has done for you but the first sign of trouble, you have become despondent. 
And so I settled myself and said, whatever will be, will be. Well, when we got to Jamaica an hour and 40 minutes late, Alex got through the COVID-19 protocols quickly because exemptions were made for him. And he rushed through the, the baggage claim and so on. He didn't take up his bags. I got them for him. While I stayed to do the protocols, he went and his mother and his aunt took him down to the overseas exam office while Jonathan waited for me until I came out long after. And Jonathan took me to Harborview, where I had to stop and get a wonderful, tasty patty and cocoa bread. One year without a tasty patty and cocoa bread is not a good thing. Okay? And no free advertisement here. But it was important. And we stopped there. And I tried getting Cynthia on the phone with no success until eventually I got through. And then the news came. Alex finished the exam long time. He was allowed to do the exam on Friday, that is physics, and he was allowed to sit his chemistry exam on Monday. And so the good news is that Alex has done his exams, and I give God thanks. I was so happy. My mind quietened down, and that is when the Lord spoke to me. You know, God waits sometimes until we are calm, and he speaks to, to us, you know. And he spoke to me by reminding me of a quote from one of my favorite theologians, a man by the name of Gustavo Gutierrez, who said that poverty is not the fact that we have no access to money. It is a reality when people have no influence to change their situations of abject need. Gutierrez was a Roman Catholic priest who had taken a vow of poverty and he suddenly realized that even though he had taken this vow, he really wasn't poor. Why? If he ever had a need, someone would get to him to help him to move forward through that need. The problem is that there are some people who are genuinely without any influence. They have nobody to care for them. They have nobody who they can get to care for them. And so when they find themselves in that need, they have nowhere to go. And that's what came to me as I thought about the fact that God answered our prayer for Alex by providing people with influence who could get him to do the exams. I'm not casting aspersions at CXC. Because it has come to my mind, come to my understanding that the CXC officials in each territory, the ones who are at the top of the CXC um, offices throughout the territory, they have the, they have the, 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 the authority to, ma to make these kinds of decisions to allow students under certain circumstances to do the exams out of time. However, what struck me was that to get to those persons, we had to have somebody of influence. We had to go through someone who could have their ears before they could hear our need. And this is what the Lord said to me. How many persons missed this exam this morning because they didn't have somebody to speak up for them? And I said, Lord, I don't know, but I suspect that some did. He said, yes. He said, yes, because they don't have someone to speak on their behalf. And it struck me that what I was celebrating was something called privilege. A privilege I had because some people of influence knew me and they were able to act on my behalf. The problem with systems that work like that through the power of influence is that they can be easily corrupted. They can be easily corrupted when it is that we can tug somebody or we can get to someone who to, can do something for us. You know, when things are like that, then those systems become easily corruptible. 
Let me mention something else that came to my mind. It came to my mind that in recent times, the church across the world has missed an opportunity or is in danger of missing an opportunity to reflect on this thing of the illicit influence that we might have benefited from. You know, with all the demonstrations across the world regarding what has happened with the killing of George Floyd and so on, the legitimate demonstrations I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the hijacked demonstrations by people with political aims. I'm talking about the fact that out of this, out of this time of upheaval, the white evangelical church in the USA has not come out smelling too good because they have not spoken about, they have not been very quick to reflect on the fact that they are a part of a system, a system that benefits them because of influence, because of influence. And that came to my mind. And as I pointed fingers in my mind at some of these great men that I have followed and I've listened to their teachings and I've been very disappointed by some of their pronouncements of what has been happening. As I thought about that, you know, this Jamaican statement came back to me, you point one finger and four more point back at you, three point and the one is trying to come back at you. And I thought about the Jamaican church and I wondered, have we also missed an opportunity to look at the illicit influence that we might have benefited from over the years. You see, since 1838, the church in Jamaica has been one of the most powerful institutions for social change. And out of that, we as God's people, we have gotten a kind of a bly, as we'd say here in Jamaica. We have gotten, gotten this kind of move ahead because of that tremendous influence and goodwill towards us. And now that we see that people are threatening that influence that we have, many of us, we become nervous and we start to find ways of rejecting what is happening while not thinking about the fact that God might be shaking this influence for us to look at what it is that we are actually doing. So, I think the social upheavals of recent times ought to be used by us as a time for reflection. Now, I'm not here casting blame or I'm not making any accusations. All I'm asking us as God's people to do this morning is to think about this, reflect on what God is saying, what he said to Israel as they faced a similar challenge, a similar problem, what God said, and let us hear from him to see how we move forward. So the book of Amos and in chapter five that was read this morning, after this nice long introduction that I just gave, mentions three ways in which God calls Israel to reflect on their illicit use of influence. And there are three things that Amos does in this passage that I think is important for us to think about as his people. First of all, in verses 4 to 6 and verse 26, Amos calls out Israel's idolatry. According to the Old Testament, Israel was God's specially chosen people through whom he would show his great love and mercy to the rest of the world. He delivered them out of bondage in Egypt and he established them as a nation that would bear his image in a special way to the world. Their own scriptures had taught them that God created the world and that God had created every person in it. And here's the important point. God had created everyone in his own image and likeness. Bible scholars say 
that we are, com we are created with the imago Dei, the image of God in us. But somehow, the children of Israel took the fact that God had chosen to start his project for the world with them to suggest that in some way they were more special than everyone else in the world. Within a short time after their deliverance from Egypt, the children of Israel sought out the gods of the people around them, gods who were believed to cater to all their needs of prosperity and importance in the world. When you look at it, what it suggests is that for them, the way God was moving was a little bit too slow for them. And so they turned their eyes to other gods. So in verses 4 to 6, Amos writes a very subtle dig against their idolatrous ways. He says, don't seek out Bethel. Don't seek out Gilgal. Don't go to Beersheba. And then if you look at those verses, you will see that, well, you don't want to see it as clearly in the, in the English text as it is in the Hebrew text, where he makes a subtle dig as to what is going to become of these places. So of Bethel, he says, Bethel, by the way, means the house of God, okay, house of God. What he says here is very interesting. If you look at the Hebrew text, and if you could read the Hebrew text, you will see that he says that the house of God will become the house of emptiness. And then he says, you know, don't seek out Gilgal. Why? Gilgal was a place of stones, a circle of stones that they encountered and were going into the promised land, across the crossing over the Jordan. And what God was promising them is that when they went into the promised land, he would give them all they needed. He would provide for them and he would protect them. He would lead them to victory over their enemies. Now the prophet says, do not go to Gilgal because Gilgal, this place that spoke about God's provision and God's protection will become your exile. You'll be led into captivity. And then interestingly, interestingly, he says nothing else about Beersheba. And what makes this interesting is Beersheba was a place of religion where religious pilgrims flocked. It was on the edge of the desert, and it was an oasis town known for its waters of refreshing. It isn't even mentioned again. In our words, don't even go to Beersheba because Beersheba will be nothing, nothingness that Beersheba has become, a religious emptiness surrounding them. There is another subtle dig in the passage. He says there at the end, that there will be no refreshing for Bethel. No refreshing for Bethel. The idea that the refreshing that would come from places like Beersheba would be totally lost. And the question is, why was God so scathing against these places? And here's the answer. Because these places which were once places of the high worship of God had become places of idolatry. They had gone, and these places which were once dedicated to God had become high places where they sat to worship the gods of the Canaanites. And God was angry. So by the time we get down to verse 26 and verse 27, this is how the prophet makes it explicit. He says, you have lifted up your, the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. Friends, there is a real danger in being God's chosen people in a dominant position in this world. It is easy for us to see the atrocities of the American white evangelical church, but we what have we seen the same of a dominant Jamaican church? 
Have we seen how since emancipation until a few decades ago, how nobody else enjoyed the privileges that we did? Well, I mean, what, let's consider this about a little bit about when you speak about privilege. We're speaking about a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. That is something that the Jamaican church enjoyed for a long time. Okay? But the problem is that could it be now that God is saying to us, you have taken that privilege and you have turned it into something that you think you're entitled to a whole lot more than I have given you. God may be thrashing that privilege because too many of us have now made that privilege into a new idol. So for instance, you know, we expect rewards of the privilege while ignoring the responsibilities that come with it. I ask that question not to make accusations, but to challenge us to a time of reflection that we put God in his rightful place at the head of our lives and not treat him merely as a sugar daddy. But let's move to the second point. Amos challenges their lack of care for the poor, verses 7 to 13. You see, there seems to be a suggestion that because Israel has misunderstood her privilege, that she has started to act in ways that picture something inhumane, unconcerned about the people's plight. Verses 7 to 13 sound like a checklist of the most heartless of people in the world. So for instance, too many of them have turned justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. That's verse 7. There are those who hate who, the one who upholds justice in court and detest the one who tells the truth. Verse 10. They levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. And then, verse 10, that's in verse 10, many of them who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts, many of them are the leaders in Israel. The outcome of such a state of affairs is quite predictable. What does the scripture say? It is at times like this that the prudent keep quiet. For the times are evil, verse 13. Again, I make no accusations against the church or us as Christians. But I wondered if Amos was talking about Israel or about Jamaica as he described those atrocities. The striking similarity has got me asking myself if I contribute to such things in our country. Do I pay bribes? Do I do backdoor deals? Do I remain silent when the powerless are trampled? Do I celebrate court victories that protect my rights and my likes while denying those of others? Am I silent because I benefit? I remember the words of a writer I read recently, which warns that when we look out for ourselves and not others, we diminish who we are without even realizing it. So she says, privilege doesn't just insulate people from, their con from the consequences of their prejudice, it cuts them off from their humanity. When we trample on people, we become less than human. But let me move on to my third point. Amos chides their religious hypocrisy verses 21 to 25. It is in a time like this that Amos finds it important to chide Israel's religious hypocrisy. They are taking their privilege as God's people to feather their own caps in idolatrous ways. This naturally meant that they stepped on the poor and outcasts, denying others what was supposed to be theirs as human beings, that they could enrich themselves 
and grow in influence. Yet at the same time, they continued with their worship as though God approved of their actions. The prophet is scathing in his remarks here. God says through him, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harp. God's logic is quite clear here, friends. Look at verse 25. Did you bring me sacrifice and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? He did not need their worship when he delivered them from Egypt. And it is not the most important thing to him in the sense that you can worship, but it can never cover up your unrighteousness. There is something that is more important because it better identifies the person with the very character of God. And what is that? It's stated in verse 24. But let justice roll, like, roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. It makes me wonder, what would a Christian community striving for justice for all look like today? I often think that this is something we ought to consider and pursue more often as a community. I know of many Christians who live out justice every day of their lives. They never cheat others. They, 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 they feel for the plight of the poor and oppressed, and they speak up for them when they can. Many of them lack the financial resources to show more than basic care for those in need. But this they do religiously and selflessly. I know of stories of poor sisters taking in children of others who have fallen on hard times. I know of a friend of mine from Rockford, for instance, who tells a story of a sister who was a higgler in town who would ensure that she took the same bus with him in the morning when he was going to school at KC. And when he got to the bus stop in the evening to go home, the sister had completed her day's sales that she would take the same bus with him to go back home. He later on found out that she deliberately did this because he was a young man who didn't have the influence of his parents. And as a church sister, she was trying to keep him out of the wrong company. This was her way of ensuring that this young man would stay on the straight and the narrow. And she curtailed her own interests to look after him. I suspect that you might even know a lot more of such stories than I do. So I am not here today to say that we have fallen away from God. That's something for each of us to think about. But as a church, my challenge for us today is that we deliberately continue doing the things that matter most to the heart of God. And if we are not doing that, then we must repent and we must become a place that floods the nation with God's justice. It is a practical question that we must deeply ponder. Let me close. The passage says a whole lot more than I've said today. In fact, if you read through the passage, you will see that God speaks with a pained expression of anger at Israel. And he promises them that he's going to punish them for their wickedness because they have misrepresented him in the world. I think that they did that 
because of a flawed sense of privilege. God's word tells them that they are going to exile because of their behavior. Yet, even that is not done in a sense to destroy Israel. God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And even though he's exacting justice on his people, he's trying to do that to bring them back to himself that they can shine as examples in the world. He wants us to understand the same of us today. There are some of us who need to continue doing what we are doing. Even when the road gets lonely and you feel that you're the only one doing what God wants you to do, you need to continue doing it because you are a good expression of God in the world. But there are some of us who might need to stop and think. And we need to ask ourselves again the question, if we have taken the privilege of being the children of God to feather our own caps in ways that deny justice to others. I call us as a church, and I call upon all Christians to make this a continuous priority issue for us as we reach out to our world. We need to take the appropriate steps as God speaks to our hearts. Amen.
as we have come to a close of our service this morning, we want to be praying with you. And there are some of you, you've heard the message and you say, I want to make a commitment to God. I want to make a commitment to be his justice in this world, his righteousness. There are some of you who are making that commitment for a first time. and You need to be become disciples of Jesus Christ. And others of you who are saying that indeed you want to continue in that way. So I want to be praying for you. So if you're making that commitment for the first time, just repeat this prayer after me. The prayer won't save you, but it's a start. It helps you to remember a day when you committed your life to Christ. Dear Lord Jesus, I give myself to you. I give myself a way that I can be used by you. I ask you to take my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to point me in the right direction as I yield to you as Savior. I give you myself to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Others of us, we need to make commitments to continue doing what God wants us to do or to repent because we have not been doing way, going the way that he wants us to go. So let's pray. Lord, we pray and we ask that you continue to speak to us through your word. And where we have fallen short, we come to you in repentance. And we ask that you forgive us of our sins and that you lead us in your ways of righteousness that we will become good stewards of your word and your way and others will see what we do and they'll glorify you, the one who lives in heaven. We give ourselves to you today and we ask you to use us mightily in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you go, let me pronounce a benediction on you. But before I do that, let me remind you, in case you want to contact us for prayer, there will be our numbers in the link below and then in the, in the, you know, the comments below that you can call our offices and you can speak to someone. But let's do the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne of grace to the only wise God, to him be glory, honor, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. There are two ways to receive personal, confidential prayer. Call us today up to 11.30 a.m. at 876-521-9437-876-521-9440-876-371-0898. And for mail callers, please ring us at 876-537-4394. Or email your request to prayer at swallowfieldchapel.org or by text at 876-395-7694. Visiting with us for the first time? Welcome. We invite you to complete the contact card in the link below to connect with us. God bless you. Join Mark Johnson and friends for the Imago Day Live fundraising online concert on Sunday, August 23 at 6.30 p.m. via youtube.com slash Swallowfield Chapel. Donations can be made by logging on to give.imagodaylife.com. Proceeds will go towards the Imago Day debut album for the next generation, as well as reaching boys in juvenile prison. Don't miss it. Youth Reaching Youth, in collaboration with NCT Vet, Heart Trust NTA offers allied healthcare training and certification. To register, contact Sanjo Spencer at 876-920-6317 or 876-926-7163. Limited space available. Register today. We give God thanks that the filters for the air conditioning units have arrived and are now being installed. We look forward to using number nine for our church services in the days ahead. Thank you for giving in these troubled times. We invite you to continue to give as the Lord enables you to support our ministries 
and those in special need. Here are a few convenient ways to do so. You may deposit your tithes and offerings in the drop box at the church office at number 7, Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Tithes and offerings can also be done by direct online deposit to our Swallowfield Chapel, BNS New Kingston current account, number 804161, branch number 50575. Or you can log on to swallowfieldchapel.org and click give to make your direct online contribution. Financial contributions for food care packages should be so indicated. And here's a reminder of this week's activities. Join us every Monday to Saturday for our online prayer meeting from 6.30 a.m. through to 7.30 a.m. via Zoom. Believers meeting takes place every Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Please join us via Zoom. The Mellow Connect Bible Study schedule for August 21 has been postponed to Friday, August 28 at 7 p.m. Also via Zoom. More Marriage Ministry presents Teamwork Making the Marriage Dream Work on Friday, August 21 at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Couples, you won't want to miss this. Swallowfield Youth Ministry invites all teens to sign up for a teen small group. Fun, laughter, Bible study, and lots more. To sign up, go to swallowfieldchapel.org slash teens and young adults. For the links to these and other activities, visit our website, swallowfieldchapel.org slash announcements. Remember to share our Sunday service live stream link with family and friends at home and abroad and subscribe to our YouTube channel.